Good afternoon, everybody. This is Tony Gentry, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at Virginia Commonwealth University in beautiful Richmond, Virginia. Um, I'm sitting in my uh, office this afternoon holding an iPhone in front of my face talking and looking at my laptop and the slideshow that I hope you're looking at as well. Um, if you're having lunch, enjoy it. I'm here today to uh, talk about mobile technologies for everyday cognitive support. By the way, if you're having any trouble hearing me, um, please send a text message through the um, web system. And Deb Hosteth from AbleNet, who is helping us with this uh, broadcast, she'll goose me and I'll try to speak up. You know that I'm an occupational therapist, so I'm going to be looking at our, at our work through the lens of everyday activities. Um, our task in cognitive rehabilitation and in assistive technology, um, as I see it, and I'm sure as you see it as well, is to help people do their own thing, uh, functioning more independently, more safely. And the mobile devices that have been evolving so quickly over the past decade or so, from Palm Pilots up to wearable health trackers now, um, can really help us help others get where they want to go. That's what I'd like to talk about this afternoon. We have about an hour, and um, there's so much we could talk about. Let's consider this an introduction, and we'll be able to carry on our conversation going forward now that we've met each other. Using these devices in therapy requires a little bit of a shift of perspective for the therapist. Because we all use these tools on our own um, as our everyday phone and whatnot, it's easy to forget that they can be very unfamiliar to our clients. A person may be really good at texting or playing Angry Birds, but they might get totally lost trying to use their mobile device as a cognitive aid in other ways. It's easy to fill up a person's screen with apps, and that gets really confusing. I like to keep my intervention down to four or five apps and make sure those are the only apps on screen if possible. You want to introduce one app and one strategy at a time. See how the person uses that support for a week or so and then add another if it's needed. It's a mix and match trial and error effort. What I'm talking about here is using a mobile device as an assistive technology. So everything you know about assessing a person's AT needs and doing an AT intervention applies. One other thing, for most of us, mobile phones and tablets are cool conveniences that have sneaked into our lives until we can't imagine living without them. Anyone who's left their phone at home knows how that feels. But for people with cognitive impairments, if they're lucky enough to have access to one of these devices. And if somebody has taken the time to show them how to use them as cognitive aids in the ways we're talking about today, they can really be life changers, serving as powerful supports for safety, for independence, and for function in everyday life. These things really work, but you, they need you to do that. As with any assistive technology, it's a two-part proposition, the device and the trainer. The biggest mistake you can make is to recommend a smartphone and an app maybe and walk away. Since the Palm Pilot days, I've been exploring ways to do just that. And I have the privilege of an AT for Cognition laboratory here at VCU where we've been doing research looking at strategies to help people with brain injuries, with autism, with post-traumatic stress disorder, with mental illness, or with degenerative neurological diseases like multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's disease, to use these tools as cognitive behavioral aids. That's a lot of different medical conditions, but from a functional perspective, from an AT perspective, many of the challenges people face remembering to do things, keeping track of the steps of an activity, multitasking, getting lost, communicating with others, managing frustration and anxiety, just negotiating the world safely. All of those challenges are similar. 
though every assistive technology intervention that we do is, of course, going to be individualized, customized to the skills, the environment, and the goals of each person. These tools can help in similar ways. We're really only at the beginning of this process, too. People with cognitive behavioral challenges are, the, are still the least likely disability group to use any kind of assistive technology. It's important to keep in mind while we're talking today that you don't have to and you, and you don't want to throw the kitchen sink of apps and devices at anybody. It's the really simple things that are the, the things that are well chosen and tried out in a person's everyday life. Those are the things that work. Probably the most powerful mobile tool in the kit is just simple reminder alarms that are available on any flip phone. It's the first thing I introduce to my clients, and it's a tool every one of them uses. It's important to keep in mind, too, that everything we talk about today could be obsolete or replaced with some cooler toy tomorrow. Um, since the technology is changing at light speed, we need to share what we've learned with each other and try to keep each other up to date. At the end of the talk, I'll share my Assistive Technology for Cognition Facebook page. That's one way we can um, try to share information as we learn together. You're looking at a picture of a young man named Krishnan. Uh, he's a young man with autism who I taught to use an iPod Touch to support task switching and performance, primarily through the Notes app, um, audio recordings, and reminder alarms at his first job as a worker at Hardee's here in Richmond. We're not talking about weird laboratory tools here. If your client has a smartphone, whether it's an Android, Apple, Microsoft, or even a BlackBerry, then most of what I'll be talking about is available to them. I'm primarily an Apple user. There are apps in Apple World that can really help people that are not yet available for other operating systems. But as a therapist, I need to keep abreast as well as I can of the other operating systems, Android and Microsoft especially, and their apps, because I don't know what tool my client may have when they walk in my office in their pocketbook. In my research, I'm primarily using Apple iPod Touches. That's because they have all the features of an iPhone except for the actual phone. They're cheaper, and they don't saddle you with a monthly bill. I like them, too, because it's easy to wear one on a belt clip or on a lanyard around your neck and keep your hands free for work without the risk of setting it down and having it walk away. That's harder to do with an iPad. But for people with dexterity challenges, for people who need a more powerful speaker for augmentative communication or to hear reminder alerts in a noisy environment, or just for people who, can, who, who prefer to see a larger screen, the iPads can work well as cognitive aids. The different operating systems all offer versions of accessibility settings, as I'm sure you know. Apples are the most robust. Whether an iPhone, an iPod Touch, or an iPad, they all read text on screen, allow speech to text, provide zoomed images and adjustments to a person's tap, along with a whole range of other accessibility features that are actually more fully featured than those offered on Apple laptops. We won't go into those in this short talk today, but it's really important for an AT professional to know about them and how to use them, since most of our clients will not be aware of how these settings work or how they can help. Fortunately, Apple and Google have really good um, websites with instructions, including videos, about how to use these accessibility settings. I do want to mention one relatively new feature, though. Using the switch control setting, a person with severe mobility impairment can scan and select apps or content within apps 
They can search the web and they can type. An add-on switch like AbleNet's Bluetooth device can link to that setting and you can plug in um, byte switches, proximity switches, sip and puff switches to the Bluetooth for anyone who needs those types of switch controls. That's a powerful feature. Similarly, the voice recognition and speech-to-text, text-to-speech feature of the mobile devices have made them accessible to people who are blind or deaf. With your expertise and those devices, virtually anyone can access and use an iOS device. Apple and Google, as I mentioned, have good instructional web pages, and AppleNet has YouTube videos, uh, sorry, AbleNet has YouTube videos for how to use the Bluetooth switch and other add-on devices if you're interested. That's the devices, but the really big deal is the apps. This slide shows how many apps were available last summer at this time, the largest number being Android at 1.6 million and with Apple right behind at 1.5 million. So when we're thinking about selecting apps for our clients to use as cognitive aids, we're really drinking from a fire hose. That's why in this talk, I want to share with you some of my own favorite apps and lead you to others so the flood is a little easier to handle. As I mentioned before, you don't want to overload your client with apps on their device. Four or five should be the maximum for everyday cognitive support. Any more and you'll just confuse people. But what you'll see and while we're talking is that you will use these apps a lot more often than you or I would. And as much as possible, you want to set them up so the apps do a lot of the work. And the person's job is to respond to the app and do what it says. If you bear with me for a moment, I just want to talk about one research project that's, that helped me learn the things that I've learned about using these tools. Um, I also have my own therapy company and see clients each week using these tools, but a lot of what I've learned came from this five-year study that was published in 2015, focusing on using iPod touches to support young people with autism in the workplace. I had a wonderful opportunity to spend time really exploring how these tools can support people with uh, moderate to severe cognitive impairment. So from my perspective, for each of the 50 participants in the project, my own involvement was pretty straightforward. I met the person as they were about to start a job trial supported by a job coach. The jobs range from food services to clerical to car washes to web builders. We met for an evaluation on the job. I introduced an app or two that seemed appropriate to support the person provided follow along and added more supports as needed. And after an average of less than 10 hours with each client, was able to call it a day. This list shows the kinds of things we included as cognitive behavioral supports on the job. Everybody was different. Everybody had an individualized set of supports. We're going to look at some of these tools in the time we have together today. So you don't have to read the research article. Here's the results in a nutshell. Half the group worked for three months without the iPod Touch, but with a job coach at their side. Half had a job coach as they began, but also got an iPod Touch and training in how to use it on the job from their first day on the job. We compared that first three months on the job to see how much job coaching support the person needed. People who got the iPod Touches up front as they started their jobs needed significantly less support from a job coach than those who didn't have it. Those who got the iPod Touch three, three months into their jobs also improved their on-job performance. What I got from the study was a wealth of on-the-job knowledge about what works and what doesn't in these settings. And here is the, again, in a nutshell, what I learned. Think of these tools as assistive technologies 
And as with any assistive technology, first assess people's functional challenges in everyday life. Examine the human supports they need in order to perform their chosen task. And then consider whether there may be a low-tech or an electronic substitute that can provide that support instead. Try to pick the simplest, most straightforward solution that works. Be sure to provide training and follow along in real-world situations to test the usability and the usefulness of the chosen solution. Solve one problem at a time and aim for no more than four or five apps for cognitive behavioral support. As you can see, I'm simply describing how to provide an AT intervention. So where do we start? I typically start with reminders. Um, all smartphones have that function. The old Palm Pilots have that function. Um, the big takeaway here, people with memory or attention problems can benefit from a whole lot of reminders, more than you would ever use yourself. Here's an example of one worker's reminder alarms for a single workday. On the left, just look at the reminders needed to get him out of the house to get to work. And at the end, the important one, plug in the device to charge it overnight so it's ready to go for tomorrow. This is an example of the robust way an app can be used as a cognitive support. A consideration here, too, is who is going to program these reminders? Some people can learn to do it themselves. Others need a caregiver to do the programming so that their job is just to respond to the message. I like to set a reminder at the end of the day, every day, to get the person and maybe their caregiver together so they can program in any non-routine reminders for the upcoming day. The reminders that come with smartphones just beep at you and show a printed message. For a lot of people, that's not enough. There are a number of specialized reminder apps on the market that work better than a beep for most people. For instance, Bug Me on the left of this slide allows you to include picture prompts for people who cannot read. And Vocal on the right is a voice reminder app for people with visual impairment or again, for people who cannot read. I'm a fan of specialized medication apps, too. My Pillbox and Pill Reminder are good ones that not only show you a picture of the pill to take, they also have a checkoff box so you know you've taken your meds and you don't double dose because you forgot that you've taken your pill. So you've got a reminder app in place, and the person you're working with is following them to move from task to task across the day. But what happens when they get alerted to an activity, but they can't remember how to actually do it? They forget or they skip steps, they get lost, they get confused. If you haven't checked out the new features of Apple's Notes or Android's Keep apps recently, you might be amazed by all the things these apps can do. You can build to-do lists with checkoffs, add in reminder alerts directly inside the app, add picture prompts. You can sketch the steps of an activity in words or pictures so that a person can use that as a guide while performing any task. And in both cases, these apps come with the device, no extra cost. Another way to help people perform complex tasks is with a picture-based slideshow. Here's one example using the mobile version of PowerPoint. I built this slideshow for a young man with autism whose pretty scary job is to load the crash carts in the intensive care unit at a local hospital. Scary because if he leaves any item out of that crash cart, someone could die. This young man had not been able to make sense of a notebook PEC system that had been tried by his job coach. And when he, <clears throat> when he became frustrated or bored on the job, typically because he was confused about what to do, he would wander away from the unit 
and people would have to track him down. This is not a recipe for keeping your job. Here's what I did. I, I made a slideshow for each drawer of this crash cart with a written instruction for it in that slide for what to do to fill that cart and provided that to him as a video slideshow in PowerPoint. Here's what it looks like. He's a good reader, so he didn't need an auditory prompt to go with that, which is a good, which is wonderful since uh, mobile PowerPoint doesn't do audio. Um, keep in mind, as he was loading the cart, he could tap the screen to play and pause the slideshow for each step, and this has really worked beautifully for him. He's a respected worker on the intensive care unit. He's trusted, and he's kept his job for three years following this model. Probably the most comprehensive way to teach someone how to do a complex task is with an instructional video. All mobile devices now, of course, have video camera and playback capabilities built in. So doing this is really easy. The trick to teaching with video modeling is to have the person watch the video before performing the task. Having the video available to play it and pause it while they do it and then asking them to review the video again afterwards to compare what they did to what the video showed. That's the video modeling model. Here's an example. Pay attention to the Hollywood production values here. The person's going to be watching the video probably on a handheld device with a very small screen. So you want to shoot close-ups with good lighting, narrative instructions, and keep it short. Fill the carafe with water up to the number two. Pour the water in the back of the coffee maker and replace the carafe. Put filter in coffee maker. Scoop two tablespoons of coffee into the filter. Close the lid and push the on button. Don't forget to turn the coffee pot off and enjoy your coffee. Another way to use a video is to provide social story instructions or behavioral cues. This young man, a hospital stock clerk, uses his iPod Touch to cue him to, to his task in the ways we've discussed. And he really likes it, and it works well for him. But then I learned that he was being bullied by a hospital visitor who accused him of aggression when he asked her to leave him alone. We made this video, which he watches on the way to work in the morning and has on his iPod Touch at work when he needs it. Hey, Jay, when somebody bothers you, what do you do? I, I, I take the hand room, I Ooh. say I'm sorry, I, I, I walk away, and I call Alyssa, my supervisor. That's the high road. Yeah, yeah. That's a good plan. To me, this is a really inspiring story. Um, AJ did exactly what the video said. Uh, this particular uh, abusive visitor continued to come back to the hospital, track him down, and bother him. Um, but. He did what the video said. He went to his supervisor for support. And eventually, as this repeated, this visitor was banned from the hospital grounds. Um, to me, it's inspiring because it allowed, this short intervention allowed AJ to take control of the situation himself. There are some good new apps 
that allow you to build talking slideshows uh, directly inside um, the, the apps themselves. Plan it, do it, check it off is a really good one for the Apple operating system. And you can see an example of um, on the left of the, of the screen that you um, use to begin creating the app, and on the right, a series of slideshows that have been created for a particular person um, showing how to do different tasks, everyday tasks. Functional planning system is another really good opportunity um, to build slideshows inside a particular app. Um, this one allows you to build libraries of both slideshows and videos. You can see this person's list of daily activity videos on the left of their screen. Easy to follow. And you can even set reminder alarms in the app. So when the alarm goes off, the appropriate instructional video pops up automatically on screen. Another similar app that I like a lot, I don't have a picture for it, is CanPlan, C-A-N-P-L-A-N, two words, CanPlan. Unfortunately for Android users, all three of these apps are Apple iOS only. I haven't found a good Android app that does the same things as well. So a few quick points on using instructional videos on mobile devices. Very powerful tool, well-researched, a lot of evidence supporting this as an instructional technology, especially when matched to reminder alarms for different tasks. It works well for complex activities, finding your way from place to place, as behavioral cueing, and in social stories. Just remember when you're making the video to follow the Hollywood production values so they can be appreciated on a handheld device. Short and to the point, use close-ups with good lighting, and if possible, add a voiceover narration while filming so you've got both auditory and video prompting to go with. And in use, follow the procedure I discussed, preview, play and pause, review, to increase retention of learning. If you have your task reminders in place, and instructional supports for complex activities, your next consideration may be calling for help when needed or person tracking. Of course, smartphones are phones, and video chat is a great way to communicate more than just words with someone who may be upset or confused. I just want to give you a quick example. Uh, one young person I was working with, a woman who had autism, was a custodian who used a bucket and a mop. Her job coach was off-site, but they were both using iPod Touches to communicate. The young woman spilled her bucket of water and began to feel as if she were going to tantrum, which is something she, she, could, she tended to do when she became frustrated. She held it together enough to um, FaceTime her job coach. She couldn't talk to her because she was so upset, but she was able to pan the phone around the room and the job coach saw what the situation was. She talked her through it, they cleaned up the room, they moved on, and this young person felt very, I guess, empowered by having taken charge of the situation herself. I'm a big fan of video chat for that reason. Phone tracking apps can help you find someone who tends to wander. Apple devices have Find My Friends <coughs> built in Google, Google Plus can do that for Android devices. And there's an add-on app, um, there are a number of them, but one that I like a lot is called Family Locator. It allows you to draw geo maps around your home or your neighborhood. So you get a text message alert when the person leaves that area. These apps are not perfect solutions for person tracking. When a cell tower connection goes down, um, as in a real quiet crisis, like an earthquake that happened here in Richmond a few years ago, they're not going to work. And the person actually has to have the phone on them in order to track them. But they're one way to help keep track of a person as long as the person agrees to let you do that. Health trackers are just now beginning to be used among rehabilitation therapists to support people who have health conditions who want to exercise more or sleep better. 
we're all familiar with Fitbits and similar tools like that. Unfortunately, it can seem that the promise of these devices is more than their actual performance. For instance, when the Apple Watch was under development, there were promises made about how it would have the most accurate pulse and blood tra pressure tracking of, of all devices, that it could track emotional stress, and be the best fitness tracker ever. It turns out that so far that's not so much the case. Even now, wearing a reminder watch on your, on your list is not a bad idea. You might set down and lose your iPad, but if your watch is on your list, it's likely to stay there. And the word is that Apple is beginning to work on using the watch to track glucose and other measures, so we'll see how this pans out as a healthcare tool. What about tracking sleep? We know that lack of sleep does a number on anybody's cognitive ability. So sleep hygiene may help our clients sleep and think better. Well, here's what this Dr. Winter did um, on a cute sort of one-man experiment. He strapped on a bunch of sleep trackers and then checked into an overnight polysomnogram sleep lab at the hospital. And this is what he found. At the top is the way the hospital said he slept, with ebbs and flows into and out of deep sleep across the night, the way most of us do. The most similar reading came from a basis watch in the center of the screen. The Fitbit and the 24-7 iPhone app at the bottom didn't do such a good job. The takeaway being, if you want sleep lab accuracy, you're not going to get it from a watch or an app. With some devices, though, you may get enough info to begin thinking about ways to help yourself sleep better and track whether your sleep seems to improve with your new tricks. The health tracking apps that I trust the most, though, are those that ask you to record how you're feeling from time to time across the day. The free mood tracker app for both Apple and Android is a good example of these. You select the condition you want to track from an on-screen list, click when during the day you want to be reminded to record your information, and then use a slider to answer a few questions about your mood or your pain or your stress. What's great about these apps is what happens when you go to the doctor. In a typical visit, the doctor asks, so how have you been over the last few months? And instead of saying, oh, I've been okay, I guess, you whip out your phone, and there's a detailed graph showing all your ups and downs day to day since the last time you saw the doctor. Really can help in titrating medications and therapies. The My Pain Diary app is a next generation version of these health trackers. It asks you to track your pain like the mood tracker does, but it also asks you to set a behavioral goal and give yourself a reward if you hit it. It's a way to begin self-managing your activity despite your pain. More and more apps with this interactive feature are beginning to hit the market. Some of them are linked to Fitbits or other health trackers, and there are some that speak directly to your doctor in a telehealth mode. I believe this is really where health tracking is going now. So one question you might ask is, does health tracking work? Most people say they pay attention to it, at least in this Pew survey from 2013. Nearly half say they actually do something different after they use a health tracker. So I would say the jury may still be out on that. Apps can help people manage frustration and anxiety, too. And if you ask people with cognitive behavioral challenges to rate their most troubling symptoms, 
We tend to ignore this, but frustration and anxiety rank high among them. Simply Being is one example of a meditation app that my clients like to use on lunch breaks or when they're taking the bus to work. It chills them out, helps them get through downtime. You can set uh, meditation um, meditations for short periods of time, for longer periods of time. You can custom fit them with music or nature sounds. Um, wonderful way to calm yourself and get through the day. When you do feel an anxiety attack coming on or feel stressed out, another good free app is the Tactical Breathing Trainer, again for Apple or Android. This app walks you through a brief, deep breathing exercise. Clients of mine who have returned from combat deployments really love this app. Um, just keep in mind, these guys have not taken a deep breath in months. They're always living on edge. The app helps them come back, begin to learn to breathe calmly again. I'm an OT, not a speech therapist, but I'm going to take the liberty of commenting just a minute on the inexpensive speech supports that have become so important to people since the iPad came on the market. If you need speech support, of course you'll call an, a speech therapist. But there are lots of inexpensive tools available now for a speech therapist to use. Of course, the speech-specific tools are out there, the Tobies, the GoTalks, and those sorts of devices. But for some people, those expensive freestanding devices are not necessary. Voice for You, for instance, allows you to tap pictures so your iPad can read out phrases for you, and you can build a customized library of the things you want to say. Hospitals have begun using touch voice, which focuses on medically appropriate phrases like, call my doctor or I need the bathroom. And my favorite of these, is the $2 app, Speak It. I have two friends with brain injuries who live here in Virginia, both of whom have pretty severe dysarthria. No one can understand them when they first meet them, what they're saying. They both give speeches using the Speak It app, and they get standing ovations for them. Okay, that's a lot of apps in a short time. Pretty quickly on this slide, Here's what I suggest you do to help people with cognitive behavioral challenges using mobile devices. Everything squeezed into a nutshell. Of course, you're going to assess their skills, their needs, the activities they want to do, the supports they already have in place, and the environments where they want to do these things, as you would with any AT intervention. Then consider the basic adaptations we've discussed, reminders, task sequencing cues, behavioral management supports, supports for wayfinding or health tracking, augmentative communication if necessary, and any, other, and any device access adaptations using the accessibility settings. Some people are only going to need reminders. Some might need instructional support for some other activities. Some may need speech support or a relaxation app. Consider the right column of this slide, too. There are add-on tools that extend the usefulness of any mobile device, sometimes a behavioral contract, some kind of reward for using the device appropriately can help the person get into using it when they're first starting. I want to give you an example of one particular person um, that, has, that I, we've worked with here. I could give you a number of them, but I think this is a good example because this is an example of, a, of an older person unfamiliar with mobile devices who nevertheless found use for them in her job. Stephanie Lau is a terrific job coach here at VCU. I worked with her to set up a research subject named Beth with an iPod Touch on her job. Beth is middle-aged, has autism, and wanted to work as a file clerk at the Virginia Employment Commission. Stephanie carved out that job for her and set up some good environmental adaptations to help Beth get her work done. You can see in the picture, she's got a private corner office, 
and there's written instructions on the wall for where to place things. But Beth had other problems. As I mentioned, she was an older worker, unfamiliar with portable devices, or really with working in an office at all. She's a perfectionist who becomes easily flustered and can have difficulty uh, verging on panic attacks when she doesn't know what to do. She had trouble finding her way from place to place in this eight-story building, um, especially when she was trying to hand out files to people or retrieve files from them. She had difficulty switching tasks across her day. She would get um, involved in one particular task and stick with it at the expense of others so that by the end of the day, she hadn't completed all the things she needed to do. And getting to and from the office was a challenge because of her difficulties getting um, finding and using the caravan bus. A lot to deal with in order to help, help her be successful in the job. <clears throat> These are the things we did. Contact info for the key support people. Instructional notes using the Notes app. Here's how we helped her manage using the bus to work and tips on what to do if she was taking a file to an office and couldn't find the right person to give it to. Okay, here are her work day reminders. As you can see, a lot more than you or I would ever use. But Beth loves them. They keep her on task. They help her switch from task to task. And the reminders provide her with reassurance that she's doing the right thing so she doesn't get anxious and have a panic attack. We also made instructional videos. The shortest one is eight seconds long. It's her checking for, you, for getting the caravan without stepping into traffic while she's looking. The longest one is a very long video, longer than I would recommend for most people. But it's important because that's how long it takes her to get from her office to the mail room, and the video shows exactly how she does that. She can follow the video and find her way to the mail room using it. We didn't leave out fun. Beth had never used one of these things before, and she was thrilled that she could download podcasts and play music. And we added a meditation app to play when she felt stressed or doing breaks. One thing I've learned is that the down times at work are when people get in trouble. During break times, your time isn't structured. So people wander off, they get into things, or they just get frustrated not knowing what to do. Beth loves her Simply Being app. She has lunch at her desk, then she does a 10-minute meditation with earbuds. When it's done, she's calm and ready for the rest of her day. So those are the four apps that, that uh, Beth has used on her job. And the question would be, did it work? Well, it did. She manages her bus difficulties with reminders, her phone, and her music. She's able to move from task to task on time. She knows what to do. She can find her way and observe appropriate safe behaviors. And she can relax and enjoy herself with her music and anxiety management apps. She continues to work at the Virginia Employment Condition. Um, we've adjusted things from time to time. Um, for instance, she can find her way to the mailroom without a video now. But she's doing well and uses her iPod Touch every day. One problem with mobile devices, because they aren't disability-specific assistive technologies, it's hard to get them paid for by a third-party payer. Those who could benefit most are sometimes the least likely to have a smartphone or a wearable. Um, no insurance covers either of them at this time. We need to fight for this through research, practice, and advocacy. These things work. They're relatively inexpensive, and people like them because they're so versatile, and they look like the same devices the rest of us use, so there's no disability-related stigma to using them. We're at the end of our time together this afternoon, but I wanted to share with you my Facebook page, Assistive Technology for Cognition. 
I posted a five year archive of ideas and apps there, and others have liked and added their own. It's one way we can communicate and try to keep up with all the changes that have been happening in mobile technology to support our clients over the years. Um, if you get a chance, take a look, like it if you like, and we'll continue to uh, share the conversation that way. These are some references from articles written over the last few years about using these tools, trying to build the evidence for how they can work to support people with cognitive behavioral challenges. We're at, we're at the end of my slide deck, and I'll be, ta I'll be able to answer any questions you have now if you'd like to do that for a few minutes. If you would prefer to um, contact me offline after the talk, my uh, email address is L-O-G-E-N-T-R-Y at vcu.edu. You can see that at the bottom of the slide there. And I just wanted to uh, say thank you for sticking with me this afternoon. As I said, I'll be answering any questions if you have them. Keep doing this work. Keep up the good work yourself and enjoy your summer. So are there any questions? I have one question asking about um, will the, will, what will we do when the iPod goes out of production, which has been projected by some to happen pretty soon. And my suggestion there, I've been doing this myself for a while, old outmoded iPhones no longer connected to a, to a um, phone account work really well as iPod touches. For instance, an iPod, iPhone 4S or an iPhone 5 that may be stuck in your drawer somewhere can turn into an iPod Touch. You just don't have to connect it to the phone any longer. That's probably what I'll keep doing, and I'm also going to be lobbying to get a new generation of iPod Touch when, I, when possible. <laughs>